Welcome to this MOOC on Raman Spectroscopy of Extracellular Vesicles, or EVs, by Augustine and Cisco Martinez and myself, Randy Carney, also with input from Tatu Rohalin. So Raman Spectroscopy is a technique that enables somebody to measure the global biomolecular composition of both single and multiple particles. Um, directly in suspension or on a surface. So, for example, using Raman spectroscopy, we can assess whether proteins, nucleic acids, uh, sugars, metabolites, sterols, and other lipids are present in the particles measured, as well as the ratios of those molecular classes to each other. Um, this measurement is label-free um, and uh, non-destructive. So, in other words, um, samples are, are, their integrity is preserved during the measurement, so they can in principle be used afterwards. The smallest detectable EV diameter depends on various parameters, but for single particle measurement typically ranges uh, between 80 and 300 nanometer, although it could be lower if smaller EVs uh, are known to be placed alone within the optical focus of a Raman scope. So in other words, single molecule sensitivity is possible, but you couldn't distinguish whether one or more EVs were present during a measurement without the use of another technique to confirm that. Um, Raman can be combined with immunolabeling to achieve molecular specificity, for example, to assess the presence of a specific protein. These are usually achieved by having um, Raman tags attached to the, um, the antibody of choice, or small molecules with a unique Raman uh, label, similar to a fluorophore for fluorescence. Um, and uh, Raman can be used to identify EVs of different origins, uh, for example, from different cell types or disease states, or identify EVs from other non-EV particles, such as lipoproteins, uh, in this label-free man uh, uh, manner. So the principle of Raman scattering can be explained as, as follows. So when light interacts with matter, different phenomena may occur. And depending on the material, light can be absorbed, reflected, scattered, or transmitted. But in particular interest is the process of light scattering, um, because this can yield molecular information about the material being uh, impinged on by the light, such as EVs. So for example, when an incident light interacts, um, like a laser interacts with the sample, the light is predominantly scattered with the same energy as that incident light. And this is known as Rayleigh scattering, um, sometimes called Ford scattering or side scattering in the context of flow cytometry. However, a very small portion of that light um, actually can be scattered with lower energy uh, or higher energy. This type of inelastic scattering is called Raman scattering, and it's special because the change in energy is precisely dependent on the chemical structure of the molecule responsible for the, the scattering. Um, unfortunately, Rayleigh is way stronger than Raman. Raman's a very weak effect, so it's pretty difficult to pick up and sort of thought of as an advanced technique. Um, so now on the right side, you can see this molecule toluene. Um, if this is illuminated by a laser light, of course, it will scatter both Rayleigh and Raman, but all scattered light can be collected. The Rayleigh can be um, ignored using some kind of filter. Um, and by collecting all of the inelastic scattering, we can build up histograms of the different scattered energy photons and form a Raman spectrum. Now, each peak here is related to a specific molecular vibration or rotation in toluene. So for example, the peaks in the 3000 wave number region here are related to carbon hydrogen bonds, as you can see throughout this molecule. Um, the peaks around 1100 over here are arising from the carbon carbon uh, in the background. These aryl rings, multiple combinations of molecules all arise, lead to, um, to uh, giving this unique spectrum. So therefore, a Raman spectrum really is a chemical fingerprint. It has several advantages in that it's label-free. You don't add anything. This is just the inherent chemical makeup of the sample. Um, and it's linear, meaning that the peak intensity scales with concentration. So the more toluene, the larger the peaks. If you were to mix in a second chemical like ethanol, the resulting spectra would be a linear combination of toluene and ethanol. So in this way, you can measure complex assemblies of biomolecules like cells or EVs and break them down into relevant uh, constituents in a quantitative manner. It's quite common for Raman measurements to be coupled into optical microscopes with a scanning stage. So one can um, perform a technique known as Raman imaging or Raman microspectroscopy. And so this type of, of uh, raster scanning sometimes referred to as hyperspectral imaging because you can collect an entire Raman spectrum at each pixel while you're scanning across um, a sample, usually sandwiched between glass or quartz slides. 
Um, the measurement can be upright or inverted. Um, the objective, in other words, can come from the bottom or the top. Um, this is shown in the inverted configuration. And Raman scattered light is also collected by that same objective. Uh, but now the light has lost some energy, so it can pass through the dichroic mirror um, uh, and into a spectrophotometer, which breaks up those energies and casts them onto some sort of camera or detector. You can generate these. Uh, the resulting Raman can be used to distinguish samples from each other based on large or even very minute differences in chemical makeup. For example, the, the difference between um, two different types of EVs, which are shown con con conceptually here uh, as, as type A and type B. This technique has been widely applied to characterize EVs over the past several years by my group, um, Augustine's group, and several others. Um, so on the left, you can see the average Raman spectra of various types of EVs and non-EV particles, including EVs derived from prostate cancer. Um, these are the LN cap and PC3 lines, uh, red blood cell derived EVs, uh, and different lipoproteins. Um, overlaid are some common spectral bands. Um, uh, these correspond to biomolecules present on the EVs. For example, you can see the amid one stretch here um, being shared in common throughout each of the particles measured. And that is just indicative that there's protein there. Um, further numerical analyses of these spectra comparatively enables distinguishing different EVs and non-EVs at the single particle level. Um, this means that Raman spectra of individual EVs can be acquired. And in this uh, plot on the right, each dot corresponds to a single particle spectrum using a technique called principal component analysis or PCA. We can start to see that tumor derived EVs can easily be distinguished from RBC derived EVs and also from lipoprotein particles at the single particle level. Raman characterization of single EVs can be performed either on a substrate, as shown on the left, or directly in suspension using a technique uh, known as optical trapping or laser tweezers, as shown in the right. Um, in either configuration, the laser interacts with EVs, um, and the inelastically Raman scattered light is collected by a detector to build up these spectra. And this spatial decoupling can be used to identify different populations and subpopulations of EVs and other contaminants within a complex mixture. As you scan around on a surface, you'll generate different uh, signatures, uh, which can be correlated back to single types of EVs. Or as you trap different particles in solution, you can build up the same sort of data. Here you can see that each of these spectrum would correspond to a different type of EV in a complex mixture. So small EVs, of course, don't sediment down to surfaces at normal gravity, which poses a challenge while performing Raman on a substrate. But to address this, EVs can be immobilized on a surface. You can dry them out uh, onto a substrate, or to preserve their native state, um, um, you can uh, bind them through nonspecific electrostatic interactions or specific binding to antibodies in solution. So antibodies are, are shown here. Once immobilized, this substrate can be imaged by sweeping across the surface with the laser, um, and the spectral data can then be translated into an image which each, with each pixel corresponding to a unique Raman spectrum, which can be correlated back to those EVs. So as mentioned before, EVs can be directly trapped in solution, but due to their Brownian motion, you actually need to temporarily trap the particles in a laser focal spot to obtain a Raman spectrum with sufficient signal to noise ratio uh, for a few seconds or longer. Um, they would diffuse out uh, if they weren't trapped by this laser. So that's why we combine these two technologies. Um, and this is known as laser tweezing or optical trapping. It's a technique developed by Nobel Prize uh, winner, Arthur Ashkin and it enables the trapping of particles by a focused laser, that same laser that's employed for, for Raman spectroscopy. Here you can see an animation of a particle being trapped. You would see the Rayleigh scattering uh, in, in increase. Um, and this is a more advanced form where you can actually monitor the scattering signal at the same time as the Raman signal, since the Rayleigh signal rapidly increases every time a particle is trapped. And using this, you can tell if no particle, a single particle, or multiple particles are trapped in each focal spot. And this can be visualized as a step increase when the Rayleigh scattering signal is plotted over time. Here you can see a zoom in of uh, a, a protein peak. Um, this is the, the phenylalanine side chain at 1000 uh, wave number. Um, and you can see it increasing as multiple particles are, are trapped. So 
To recap, Raman spectroscopy derives the biomolecular information of the interrogated sample by measuring inelastically scattered light to form a spectrum, plotting intensity versus wavelength um, or energy of the scattered photons. To reproducibly collect such information in a calibrated manner, um, for example, uh, what is needed to compare Raman measurements across different samples and instruments, you have to calibrate both the wavelength, usually by using a known reference material like polystyrene beads or toluene, as shown earlier, um, and also the intensity. Um, and the intensity is usually calibrated by by the use of, of spectral lamps, known uh, NIST traceable spectral lamps, which themselves have to be calibrated on an annual basis. So both calibrations using chemicals and um, specialized lamps can be used to, to calibrate the X and Y axes during this measurement. And they should be done uh, ideally every time you, you collect data, but especially anytime something changes in the optical path. Interpretation of Raman peaks, uh, also known as Raman shifts, so the x-axis uh, um, information, are only possible when you're performing routine calibration against such uh, reference materials. And there are many sources of lookup tables for identifying particular peaks ascribed to a given chemical vibration or rotational mode. Now, the presence of a peak in a calibrated spectra is used against these lookup tables or other standard reference measurements to identify the presence of a given chemical species or molecule. The y-axis information or Raman intensities are also useful since, as I mentioned before, they're linear with concentration. They can be compared and deconvolved to measure relative ratios between species. Um, if you've calibrated your system using reference standards, um, uh, for example, a pure lipid of known density, you can actually get absolute concentration from the peak intensity. So it can be this linear mixing can be very powerful to determine relative or absolute concentrations of particular species in your in your solution. For a given molecular species, um, such as a molecule that's represented by a handful of Raman shifts, this chemical fingerprint, the lower concentration detection limit is constrained by how efficient it scatters light, since not all uh, molecular vibrations scatter light equally. Um, but typically, one can easily measure down to roughly picomolar concentrations, um, generally speaking. Uh, when combined with surface enhancement, which is uh, performing Raman near a nanostructured metallic metal or material such as um, gold nanoparticles or silver nano roughened substrates, you can measure femtomolar or even single molecule amounts. And that technique is known as SIRS or surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And the full description of um, its application is beyond the scope of this discussion, but we'll, we'll mention it once or twice more here, especially since its applications are growing to measure EVs, uh, especially by my group and others. Um, now, the upper concentration is generally um, given by the, is constrained by the focal volume. Um, and uh, for most imaging systems, this can roughly be approximated as a cube of a few hundred nanometer. And we'll discuss this a bit more detailed on slide um, 16 coming up. Um, so that's it for molecules. But when thinking about e whole EVs, the situation is a little bit more complex. Um, in an optical trapping experiment, it is possible to estimate the size of EVs uh, by measuring the Rayleigh scattered light. Uh, this method relies on several assumptions, such as uh, the refractive index um, of single EVs, uh, um, assumption of an EV shell core model, the shell thickness, um, and that you're actually trapping a single EV. By estimating these, the, the Rayleigh scattered light in arbitrary units can be calibrated using light scattering theory and reference particles like polystyrene or, or silica. And this enables the calculation of the size of trapped particles and the determination of their distribution within a sample. So in this example, polystyrene and silica beads were used as reference particles to calibrate the, the Rayleigh scattering uh, in intensity and also validate the calibration. So by calibration, we mean that we can relate the measured Rayleigh scattering intensity in arbitrary units to the theoretical scattering cross-section in square nanometer. The Rayleigh scattering signal is obtained by optically trapping individual beads as seen in this time trace. So these are uh, single and multiple beads being trapped uh, just by letting them naturally translocate and kick each other out of our optical trap. Single events uh, can be observed as these stepwise increases in the amplitude of the scattered light. And using me theory, you can then predict the scattering cross-section of single polystyrene and silica beads of different sizes um, and translate those single trapping events into that scattering cross-section. 
After calibration, one could predict the Rayleigh scattering cross-section in nanometer squared on the, on the left axis, uh, and thus the corresponding Rayleigh scattering uh, intensity in arbitrary units on the right. Um, you can do this from EVs, and of course, there's several assumptions that, that, we're, that we're making here, um, but this is important um, to, for example, determine the detection limit of our instrument, which in this case, uh, this is how we derive those numbers, 80 to 320 nanometer. You can estimate the size range of the measured EVs and confirm that they exceed the detection limit. However, the accuracy of such determination using optical trapping and Rayleigh scattering will depend on several factors, such as the configuration of the optical setup, which is not trivial. So while this method can provide an estimation of EV size range, it may not be as accurate as more uh, specialized techniques, um, you know, especially direct imaging techniques like cryo-electron microscopy. To assess how Raman spectroscopy handles polydispersed samples, it's really important to take into account that nearly all the biomolecules inside the laser focal spot will contribute to the Raman spectra, whether they're in EVs, within EVs, or EVs plus other contaminants outside or non-EV materials. So how, when dealing with EVs that are larger than the focal volume, part of the EV is outside the focal volume, so it won't be measured and it won't contribute to the Raman spectrum. So the size of the focal spot, um, as shown here, can actually be pretty challenging to measure experimentally, but theoretical calculations can, of course, provide an estimation of this focal spot, depending on parameters such as the uh, laser wavelength um, and especially the numerical aperture of the, of the microscope objective. And this is a measure of the angle of, of light, which is being collected back into your objective lens. Um, and ideally for optical trapping and good Raman performance, you want a very high numerical aperture approaching one, um, which is um, nearly impossible to reach because you can't collect all the light coming, for example, horizontally here. So using this, we can estimate, you know, for a Gaussian beam with a wavelength of 647 nanometer, that's a typical red laser, and a numerical aperture of 0.95, which is a very, um, would be a very high NA, good objective. Uh, our focal spot would have a theoretical radius of around 200 nanometer and a Rayleigh range of 1.2 micron uh, based on the full width at half max. Uh, in this case, EVs with a diameter larger than 400 wouldn't be fully measured, but that should sufficiently capture most particles uh, in, in the range that, that we typically care about for small EVs. Nevertheless, of course, scanning the sample uh, by either moving the laser or the stage can uh, enable us to measure EVs that are larger in diameter than the focal spot. So here's a small EV trapped in the laser. Of course, you can have multiple ones trapped in the laser, a very large one, which would be uh, only partially probed by the laser. And then here's an example of sweeping across our laser across multiple sizes to average over those and collect robust measurements. So here's an example using cells, where actually you can see how images from Raman data can be built up. And in the left panel, you can see an SEM image of white blood cells. Uh, many that are uh, here uh, precipitated onto the surface and their corresponding Raman um, spectra. So in this case, the Raman spectra actually acquired at each spot or pixel along this image by raster scanning, actually in, um, in smaller um, subsections here that you can actually see. Um, and after some data analysis, Pixels with similar Raman spectrum can be grouped and assigned with a given color. We can do that back into our optical image as well. So in this way, um, pixels of the same color would correspond to regions of similar chemical composition with their corresponding Raman spectra shown in the right. And this way we can classify cell type and uh, you can extrapolate this to EV type as well. So with regards to some practical information, it can take as little as one millisecond or faster to make a measurement, usually for surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy or SIRS, um, a few seconds for surface-bound EVs, or even up to a minute or longer for optically trapped um, uh, vesicles. But typically, we're in uh, the range of 5 to 10 seconds in modern systems will um, provide you enough uh, robust information even for the single particle measurements. While biomedical applications of Raman have historically lagged behind due to the complexity of, of the data sets, Raman is already widely used uh, in the food industry for anti-counterfeiting, explosives detection, and other forensic investigation, as well as heavily used in pharmaceutical industry for quality control of, of medications. So in general, it's possible to, to purchase auto samplers or to scale to industrial applications, um, but we aren't there yet in general for EVs, particularly for, for, for single trapping.
it's hard to say if Raman is actually real time. You, you can certainly measure spectrum in real time, but the spectral data interpretation, peak assignments and comparisons are where you get value in EV measurements. And these take significant uh, uh, time and expertise, particularly on the, on the data analysis side. So in addition to the reference standards mentioned before for calibration, for a typical EV measurement, you should include a few uh, key controls, such as the buffer and substrate um, only without EVs. Uh, it's critical to measure all of these at the same exact uh, settings, laser power integration time. Um, if you want to fit certain biomolecule classes to your Raman spectra to look at relative ratios of lipids, RNA, cholesterol, you should measure those as purchased as analytical standards, again, using the same settings and substrates. Spiking controls are useful in certain contexts. Um, for example, to determine the limit of detection of rare EV subtypes amongst a mixture and detergent lysis controls, such as those mentioned in my SEV document can help confirm that the particles you're actually trapping are EVs and not some other particles or aggregates. Uh, as with all EV measurements, accurate reporting of the experimental details uh, is absolutely key, uh, including all the optics related settings shown here. Um, laser wavelength, power, magnification, integration time, measurement time, number of spectra, um, step size as you're sweeping across samples. Um, uh, in addition to all of the information for calibration, the materials used, the protocols, the details of the substrate used, and any treatments, um, and especially the EV concentration of the solutions from, from which you're measuring. Um, typically, very little EVs are needed for this type of analysis, somewhere in the range of a few microliter of 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 EVs per mil. You can make measurements with, with fewer, um, and usually samples more concentrated need to be diluted to, to get into this range. One thing we haven't mentioned too much here is that data analysis from raw to cleaned up spectra is not trivial for Raman. Data are typically normalized, smoothed, denoised, background corrected to remove, for example, any baseline arising from autofluorescence of the sample. All of these processing schemes should be clearly reported alongside the published data. Some do's to emphasize, um, definitely can consider the substrate. We normally prefer quartz over glass due to its low intrinsic autofluorescence at typical wavelengths that we use to, to collect Raman scattering. Um, we always keep the laser power and integration time fixed across samples to accurately um, ensure to ensure accurate comparison. Uh, we perform and record uh, and report daily wavelength and intensity calibrations using um, material reference standards and light lamp standards. We use dilution series to optimize EV concentration, especially for single trapping to avoid uh, swarming or multiple EVs trapped at the same time when you think you're getting just one. And we always report raw data um, uh, prior to any processing. This is great to include as a supplement or as, um, in, in, as a raw data set published alongside any uh, report. Some don'ts, don't look directly into the laser and in general consider proper laser safety. We recommend to avoid overfitting uh, of data. In other words, trying to fit every little peak to a defined molecule, especially without, without proper calibration. And always consider that fluorescent labels can confound Raman measurements because after all, these are molecules that too um, uh, uh, and do show up in, in spectra. There are several representative samples which are um, exciting to talk about. There was some of the first studies um, done on single EV trapping, which showed that there were distinct chemical compositions of EVs collected from different cell types, cancer and non-cancer, um, within uh, cell culture isolated um, EVs by ultracentrifugation. One of the key findings of this study was that a, a lipid to cholesterol ratio could distinguish tumor EVs from cell culture um, from, from non-tumor EVs. Another study um, published in JEV in 2020, really distinguished single EVs from different sources and also from, from lipoproteins. This was the data that was shown a few slides earlier. And also that you could use the Rayleigh light, uh, usually which is um, very pesky and annoying for, for Raman spectra because it doesn't report on molecular char characterization. This paper actually utilized that, that light to, to size uh, EVs at the same time as determining their composition by Raman. Um, and this, of course, was able to distinguish and size um, different EVs from different sources and from lipoproteins. Raman also has been used to, um, to determine purity of, of EVs. So by isolating them by different methods, um, this group um, 
was able to uh, to show that they could tell apart EVs from different cell sources and even their relative purity, depending on the isolation procedure that was used. Um, in general, Raman is is widely used for the estimation of of broad molecular classes of EVs, as shown on the right here, really distinguishing those proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, carotenoids, um, which are particularly Raman active. Um, and has been used time and time again to show this intra-sample molecular heterogeneity of EVs, uh, particularly when applied to single trapping. SIRS, uh, the Surface Enhanced Raman Spectroscopy, is really an application that is uh, dramatically increasing in, in, in the recent years. And a lot of the name of the game is to combine these nanostructured metallic particles or arrays in the vicinity of EVs, either by precipitating them down, capturing any Raman scattering which happens in the near field within a few nanometer from these nanostructured surfaces will be immensely boosted. Um, this uh, leads to a lot of um, increase in complexity, certainly of measurement and in calibration. So it's very much a re uh, on, the, on the forefront of research um, right now. But that dramatic boost of sensitivity that you get from this plasmonic effect of being in the near field of, of gold uh, is very exciting and might lead to some applications in, um, in detection for cancer with very small input of EVs. There are some work that's being done in well-ordered lith lithographic substrates. So these are um, immensely precisely engineered um, complex plasmonic arrays that are made to capture, you know, single EVs right at the optimal spot, um, apply this Raman technique and get very sensitive data down to the single EV using microseconds of, of integration time. So now we're approaching the speed of things like fluorescence. Also, SIRS was used recently um, by my group to show um, that even amongst complex mixtures where EVs are heavily contaminated by lipoprotein, we can account for that lipoprotein by looking at the molecular signature of our Raman spectra, um, but that we can still retain very high diagnostic accuracy to distinguish cancer EVs from control EVs, even uh, enriched from, from patient samples with a varying presence of lipoprotein contamination. So we can at once account for that contamination and see through it to retain high diagnostic accuracy. There are several future developments that will need uh, uh, that will continue to improve this technique. Um, one of them is, is, of course, this use of SIRS. So uh, bringing those EVs into the vicinity of these metal surfaces um, is, as I mentioned, something that's really on the horizon. Um, this will definitely uh, 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 allow for significant improvements for limit of detection and, and hopefully increasing that clinical sensitivity and specificity. And it allows multiplexing and assay design. So we, now you can imagine these sensors be into, being integrated with microfluidics for very rare EV isolation and analysis uh, in one platform. Um, there's a lot of problems here. The EVs need to be in the near field within a few nanometer away from the gold. And this um, orientation of the molecules into that near field matter a lot. So you can't always tell if you have more molecules or if they're in a more favorable orientation to these plasmonic surfaces. So quantitative measurements are very challenging. Also, uh, in solution, EVs are dramatically diffusing, rolling, moving around. And so the spatial and temporal heterogeneity of the signals arising from these measurements make them very complex to, to analyze. Some other developments are what's known as SPARTA, Single Particle Automated Raman Trapping Analysis. And this is a scaling up of, of an automation of the trapping. So it's not manually done. It's actually, um, in this iteration, the Rayleigh scattering is used as a trigger to turn on and off the laser and to um, rapidly and automatedly scan through hundreds of molecules or even thousands of molecules and trapping with, with hands-off time from the operator. So this is a way that we're speeding up the spontaneous Raman um, analysis of EVs. Finally, of course, um, with this rich spectral data, the um, advancements in machine learning data analysis is enabling um, rapid um, clarification and analysis of large amounts of data sets with a high degree of, of automation. Um, here's a few examples of that where um, EVs that are collected from, um, from diseased or healthy sources are many, many of them are, are collected. Um, uh, you know the labels of these EVs before, and you can 
um, basically train advanced uh, deep learning models to understand the molecular differences or, uh, reflected in the Raman spectra from these um, and apply this to to early stage diagnoses in, in many different contexts. Um, so this MLAI is particularly suited for these feature rich uh, Raman spectra, but we're still in the early days here. Um, many new studies are actually focusing on combining these neural networks with SIRS, such as nanoboles or other sort of nanoplasmonic arrays um, for automated classification and with really low sample input and a really fast time. Here are many of the references that we collected uh, throughout this talk. You can read uh, on for more. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for listening a little bit about um, the sort of state of the art and future uh, applications for Raman spectroscopy to EVs. And I hope you would reach out to myself or Augustine who prepared these uh, materials if you have any questions or interest in furthering your understanding or application of this technique. Thanks very much.